Welcome, everyone. I'm Darren Root, and this is another episode of What's Next and When. I'm passionate about helping people in the tax and accounting profession keep up with just the ever-changing dynamics of the profession, and boy, is it ever-changing. And I've invited today Tom Hood to be with me, and I can't think of a better better guest to have. Tom's the AICPA Executive VP in charge of business growth and engagement. Tom, welcome. It's awesome to be here with you, Darren. Hey, did I get your title right? Yep, you did. did. I screw that up? Yep. Awesome. No, no, you got it right. Congra- <laughs> Congratulations on that new role. How, how long has that been now? So since uh, it's, it's, it's going on seven months. Pretty new. Awesome. Well, uh, you know, I, I'd like to just let people get to know you a little bit for those who don't. Um, can you discuss a little bit about your previous role uh, and your move to the AICPA? Yep. Yeah, so um, I was the CEO of the Maryland Association of CPAs for 24 years. Prior to that, I was a CFO in industry in a highway construction company for 15 years. So uh, I like to say I was a product of the profession, right? From the minute I passed my CPA, the CFO that I worked for back then said, get into the AICPA and the MACPA and begin to volunteer and I did, and that led me to my role at Maryland, and ultimately it led me to this uh, global role with the AICPA and SEMA. Well, you're obviously phenomenal at it because, I mean, the Maryland Association was sort of a, you know, it was a gem uh, among all associations, so you did a fantastic job, and I know you had a great team there. Um, but this move to the AICPA gives you just a, a much larger um, impact potentially. Can um, can you talk about kind of what the differences are that you're seeing between the two roles that you've had? Yeah, I think, you know, <clears throat> one, one I was the, the boss. I was the CEO reporting to the board of directors. Mm-hmm. Now I report to Barry Melanson, who's the CEO. So that's a, that's a new role for me. I'm also yeah. in a much larger organization. It's global. Uh, we've got offices all over the world versus – in Maryland, we basically had one office location, you know, 30 people roughly. Um, and then the, the thing that's the same is the Business Learning Institute, which we started back in 98, um, which was the uh, place for basically the development of what we called success skills. Many call them soft. Mm. And, um, you know, Barry Melanson, when he brought me up to the AIC Basima said, uh, can we bring BLI with you? And uh, obviously, we had to go to our board of directors and, and all that. But uh, but BLI came with me and uh, a small team from there, about four people have uh, joined me in the association here. And BLI is a kind of a division of the AIC Bay SEMA and continuing some of that work here. Can you just give our audience a little update on what BLI is doing? I mean, yeah. what, what's who, who's in that? What's the, what's the goal there? So the Business Learning Institute was formed to basically develop the new skills that we saw emerging in the profession. Mm. From the research that goes all the way back to the CPA Vision Project and the CPA Horizons Project. And Darren, it was, it's, we described it as a T-shaped professional. So taking those mm. core technical and accounting and tax skills, obviously the, a knowledge of the data that CPAs and accounting all know, and then building that, what we call boundary crossing skills, skills like you know leadership and sense making, anticipating and serving evolving needs, integration and collaboration, strategic and critical thinking, and um, and being data savvy and beginning to understand the technology side of that. So those skills that go across help you cross disciplines, help you cross silos help you cross other business units if you're in a corporate setting. And those are the skills that BLI has been specializing in um, literally for, since 1998. So those skills, we brought a portfolio of about 600 programs to the uh, AICPA and SEMA. And now we're kind of linking and leveraging other programs they already had that might have been in that wheelhouse to really come up with a really good solution for firms and corporations to build the competencies for where we know the future's going. 
Where, where, where's the best place if somebody's listening today to go out and find, to go to and find a little bit more information on this? So you can go to our site, blionline.org. That's where you'll see a lot of those courses and all listed. Our sales team, okay. Pam Devine, came over uh, as the director of, she's now a solutions engineer at the AIC Bay SEMA. And then we had three of our sales team, uh, Natalie, Jennifer, and Ryan, who actually are now integrated into the bigger AIC Bay SEMA sales team, but bringing all their knowledge of our portfolio into those AICPA teams. So together we're building out, you know, even bigger curriculums for literally Fortune 500 corporations, finance teams, as well as small firms up to the largest firms. That's awesome. Uh, before we move forward, I just want to give Barry Melanson a shout out. I mean, I've gotten to know this guy. Now you've gotten to know him even a lot better, but I've gotten to know this guy over the last, I don't know, 10 years. You know, for a guy who's running the AICPA, he has a phenomenal handle on just the yeah. issues uh, across the board. I mean, I've, I've not seen a guy who has the gra who has a grasp of issues like like Barry does. No doubt. And, uh, you know, so when he came to me and said, Tom, I've been watching what you guys are doing. I think it would be a, a big win win if we could get you into the global group and give you a global platform to help us continue to move. So it's really been exciting to be able to work with him and the rest of the team who are all, you yeah. know, equally talented, I think. Yeah. Yeah, great team. I looks looks like you're working from home. Is that a true statement? I am working from home. So yeah, everybody's now in my uh home office here in Baltimore City and uh okay. Yeah. And I I will be staying out of this location. Um, the nice part about this is I'm kind of equally distant from headquarters in Manhattan, so I can get a jump a train and be up there in two hours. And our plane ride to Raleigh-Durham, which is where a big other part of our team is. And then the rest of the time, you know, I know like you, we're on the circuit. So we'll be out at conferences, firm events, things like that, and uh, on the road from that standpoint. Now, we probably won't resume that due to the Delta variant until – first quarter of next year. I'm doing some limited travel right now that was all pre-scheduled, uh, but we're being a, a bit cautious because of this Delta variant. Yeah, seems seems to be the case across the board. Yeah. So let's let's jump into it, Tom. Um, I've, I would love to know what you think is the biggest challenge uh, that you see from your perspective facing the small and medium-sized accounting firm today. What, what do you think it is? So uh, it's it's definitely talent with, without yeah. a doubt, right? It's It showed up on the top issues for PCPS this year. It's been on there pretty much every year. It's kind of evergreen. It's gotten more acute, and, and here's why, because this ties into the pipeline issue, Darren, which is another part of that issue, right? Where's the supply of future CPAs, accounting majors, et cetera, coming from? And if you think about it, this is what we've talked about a lot, the idea of hard trends from our friend Daniel Burris. So he says there's three things that you can actually predict, and then you should be thinking about what those impacts are on your business, your clients, et cetera. And those three hard trends, as he calls them, future facts, demographics, the number and type of people in the marketplace at any given time, uh, technology, which is moving forward at an exponential rate, which makes that one another issue, it is on the top issues list as well. And then the third one is government regulations and standards. And we all know how much we've had to live through that hard trend actually blowing up in light of the COVID. But you're gonna, you can count on it, and we're listening to it right now in the Biden administration dealing with this major infrastructure, et cetera, that's gonna impact taxes again. So you've had major tax legislation literally almost every year on top of the pandemic relief that all of those practitioners are going to have to deal with. So while we say talent, the other part of it is this kind of consuming speed of the new regulations and tax laws coming at us uh, on top of the, te the technology part. So those are all there from that standpoint. But let me go back to demographics. We've all talked about baby boomers now for years, right? Baby boomer wave, retiring, mm -hmm. uh, right? Baby boomers are now finally retiring. But if everyone remembers when we were talking about that, the generations behind baby boomers, Gen X, 
which was a lot smaller than baby boomers, a little bit of a spike with millennials. But now Gen Z is also another down spike. Just look around you and say, how many friends, children are having a lot of children? And at what age are they having children? So you, you get that right. There's a lot less people having numbers of children in the market. And most like my children haven't had children yet. So they're all mm -hmm. extending. So we have literally a physical shortage of people that would be eligible to get into the pipeline. And then on top of it, you've got, you know, this whole great resignation going on. So people are switching jobs, but there's a shortage of just about every kind of occupation you can think about, right? From truck drivers to CPAs. You know, it feels like pre-pandemic, the number one issue was staffing or, you know, talent. Um, and, and it was it was certainly an issue and it always showed up. But something happened during during the pandemic, and and people have just gone away. Yes, I mean it's it, it's catapulted. Do you see? Um, well, I, I I haven't talked to a small firm yet that is not either losing people or struggling to find people, and it's it's more the losing people. Yes. which is even interesting. Before, I think it was more about talent acquisition. Correct. But now it's about talent retention and acquisition. Is that what you're seeing as well? I'm seeing the exact same thing, Darren. And, and I'll tell you, I've heard, um, I've heard a couple of different reasons for it. But um, the best one I heard is, is a, a, a lady we're working with right now named Britt Andriata. I just did a, a LinkedIn Live interview with her. She's a neuroscientist. And so she studies change and the human brain. So this is brain science, not like pop psychology. So she said, here's, here's her view of this. There's, it's, we're in the perfect storm right now, which is creating a lot of nuanced behavior. First of all, we know the pandemic, which we thought was what, two weeks to flatten the curve. And then we said maybe six yeah. months. Now we're on 18 <laughs> months and going. She yeah. said the human brain is wired to handle a tragedy for about six months like the time of an mm -hmm. earthquake or a tornado to recover, right? So she said, we've now exhausted our ability to adapt and, and continue dealing with this level of stress. So it's like kind of short circuiting us. You add to that the social change that happened after George Floyd and that continuation over the summer and even now. Uh, and that's another major layer of stress and trauma, if you will, people dealing with it. Um, and then the third one is the kind of continuing march of technology that by all purposes, they've said now has accelerated by at least five years through the pandemic, mm. e-commerce by 10. So just layer those three things there and say, how is the average person dealing with it? So Brit says what they do is they say, I got to change something. What's one of the easiest things to change? Mm. Your job. Yeah, And that's what we're seeing. People are literally up and quitting. Sometimes they don't even have jobs. Um, certainly that in that shortage, then prices are going up. So now they're even if they weren't looking, they're seeing all these offers of huge increases. And mm -hmm. that's what we're seeing happen. So we're seeing people leaving the profession at, you know, not an alarming rate, but it's a it's a pretty heavy rate. Uh, and then all the job shifting going on. But what the small firm is facing is exactly the same thing as the Walmart CFO is facing. I mean, it's the same thing at the large corporate level and the large firm level. It's everyone. Yeah, I'm, I'm on the board of a publicly traded bank and our, one of our biggest issues, talent acquisition right now. We can't feel we can't even fill roles. Uh, so you hear it across the board. But, you know, I guess from the what's next and when perspective, you know, what's next is is talent. I don't think is coming back into the profession at the, at the rate that we're going to need it. Correct. So a real talent drain, even at the smallest firm level. So when's that going to have an impact? I think it's having an impact right now. But, you know, I think the big question is, is what do you do about that? So I mean, I, we're, we're identifying the issue, but what do we do? Well, I, I can tell you at the, at the AICPA, we've began mobilizing. We're working with state societies. And it's a big part of our agenda. And we've done this before. We've we've tilted the pipeline um, by really focusing on a ground game to high schools and colleges, 
and working with the state societies and universities and begun to tilt that supply a bit. So that's a big initiative that we're getting focused on as we speak. I think the second yeah. part is, and you know this, it's about automation and being really smart. So things like you know, lean processes and project management and making sure you've got robotic process automation workflow and do everything you can to automate. If you have a, a CAS, a client accounting service practice, there's tons of things that you can automate right now with all the players that are in the market. Take advantage of those technology hard trends. And so that's a big one. There are also strategic outsourcing groups I'm seeing, even for small firms, that could help you from that perspective. But it it's a time for you to really re, and we've said this before, reflect and reimagine what your business should look like post-pandemic. That's a big thing that you have to do because look at all the other businesses that are totally reinventing themselves. Look at your average restaurant on the corner or small shops and start to say, what are things that they're going to need in the future that I might be able to help them with in addition to all the relief funds that you did? And then go a step further and say, how can I add more value? Because through the pandemic, the small firm was pivotal in get, keeping our economy going and keeping all those small businesses surviving. And now you've earned a ton of their respect and so and you've learned how to consult. So now up your game, don't go back to the old way, get going on that strategic value added consulting role, which is exactly what we're telling our counterparts in business and industry, right? In the in the CGMA and corporate space. You know, I think that oftentimes when I hear, have heard over the years, hey, you need to move to higher value services to the consulting component. You know, on, on the other side, on my other ear, I would hear you need to get rid of, you know, the things that's making you money. And and that's not a true statement. No. So I just want to make sure we, we say that. So what I, what I heard you say is, wow, our, our customers really want us to provide this higher level of service, and we should be doing that. There, there's no question about that. We should automate the other components. Yes. We should re-engineer our practices, and we should leverage automation in those areas. And some of those areas, just to throw a few out, in the old days, five years ago, you know, we were, we were throwing people at payroll, you know, generating payroll for clients. Today, technology can do the vast majority of that if you have the right technology solutions. In the CAS practice, the client accounting service practice, in the old days, we threw people at keying in transactions. Today, we can automate that. And even in the tax practice, Tom, I, I think the old days, we just tried to stay longer hours, which is exacerbating our people problem because they don't want to do that anymore. Right. Instead, we, we maybe need to look at, at sort of automating components of that and outsourcing potentially components of that. To your point, we need to re-engineer the way we think about our businesses right now. It, the time is truly now, Darren, because many it of is. them kind of, whether they wanted to or not, became those advisors and did a really good job. And now it's like, let's double down on that and do that by automating to free up more time so you can spend on those higher value activities. Right. You're right. We're not saying get rid of any of that. What we're saying is get it automated and efficient as you can and then free up that time and move it over. It's the same parallel for that you know, CFO in a small or mid-sized business, which, which I was at one point. And it was like, how do I make room for the, the, what the CEO wants me to do, which is project things? You know, here's a, here's a great stat. During the initial month of the pandemic, a survey of CFOs said that on average, they were doing 30 times the data analytics projections and forecasting that they did pre-pandemic. Think about that. Wow. 30 times. Now, isn't that the same opportunity for that CPA who's an advisor of their small businesses? Yeah. I, I, I totally agree. I, you know, data is a word that gets that gets tossed around a lot, but no matter what setting I seem to be in, I hear people talking about the need to get their their hands around, their head around data and turn it into information, actionable items, things that can help people. Accountants are, are no different. There's data swirling around every firm I know of and 
firm owners are not really capturing that in a meaningful way and making sense of it for for their clients. I mean, I've seen some firms that, you know, might have a specialist in, I know a couple that are specialized in like craft breweries or another in restaurants. So if you've got any of those industry specializations or enough clients in a given industry, imagine what happens if you could like look across them and look at the data from a benchmarking standpoint and advising them, why is a, a margin in one business in the same industry much different than one in another business? And what are they doing differently? And without sharing specifics or data, you can't do that, but you could do the what we call the generic stuff. Like what are those trends across when you slice across that data? And yeah. that's a perfect opportunity. And then go to them with a dashboard and saying, here's where you are. And we're knowing that a lot of our other clients are in these kind of categories. What, what's, what do you think's going on there? Yeah, I, I think what we're saying here is staffing is not, the, the challenge with talent acquisition or staffing is, is not going away. It's arguably one of the biggest challenges facing the profession imminently and probably on into the future. And so I think what we're suggesting is a re-engineering, a, a hard look across all service components of your practice. Yeah. How can you automate those things? And then also, how do you serve clients better with higher value services? After, so if you can automate and free up some bandwidth, then you need to turn your attention to obviously helping your clients because our clients showed us during the pandemic that's exactly what they want from us as a profession. Exactly. Moving on a little bit, Tom. Um, you know, I was graciously invited to the uh, um, AICPA event, Executive Roundtable, and uh, one of the things I heard you guys present at, at, at that event was this concept that, you know, there's fewer people entering or in colleges and universities in the accounting programs right now and fewer people taking the exam. So this is, I guess, sort of piling on to our, our staffing challenges. Can you talk about that just a little bit? Yeah, I mean, you know, what's happened and this, we've seen this coming over the last couple of years, right? So the, the pricing for like data analytics, um, the technology jobs, all those started to draw a lot more graduates or, or people entering college into those majors than we could in accounting as much, which is again, why we're looking at this ground game to get start restarted. Yep. So that certainly pinched us. We also saw, and you're seeing it in the, in the world right now, this kind of social movement of, we, do we all need to go to college or can people get away with cheaper colleges? So the idea of, of junior colleges and community colleges mm -hmm. is another area where a lot of people are steering their children when they have influence. Uh, so you've got that dynamic. And then the whole accounting profession. So you know, I'm, I'm, I was a first generation uh, college graduate in my family. And the reason I got into accounting is I wanted to be an FBI agent and that was the easiest way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if my, my family would have never recommended accounting because they never had any exposure to an accountant. They weren't, they, you know, they were probably middle income at yep. best and they never had a CPA or an accountant helping them uh, do any of that work. So the average person, if you're, if you're not already from a generation where there's professionals and, and a bigger business in your background, you would never know about CPA or accountant. And now, you know, you've got to get, so we've got to crash through that. That's why we've got to go down into the high schools. The, the other piece is um, many of the high school accounting programs, which could be your first introduction to it, are actually not very good sometimes. And so that gives you a bad taste about, you know, is this all this is? So we have a whole lot of ground to make up in terms of, of focusing on our image and what it really means to be a CPA and to be that kind of value added partner, if you will, in the business community uh, or in a business. So I think that's a big part of it. And that's not clearly what we're trying to address. Feels like uh, a bit more of a long game. It is a long to game. To me <laughs> on this, Tom. And so we're, you know, imminently, we're not going to see probably a solution to the talent challenge if we ever see a solution to that, which sort of leads me into my, my, my next topic, which, you know, you were a CFO in your prior life, um, which is, is great training for this, this concept of supply and demand. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure you had to deal with it all the time. And so what I hear when I hear staffing challenges and an enormous amount of work is supply and demand. Yeah. And, you know, firms, I don't think, think of their businesses from a supply and demand perspective. You know, one of the, I, I, one of the last classes I had at Indiana University as I was getting ready to, to graduate was a course on supply and demand and, and how to think about that. And, and I suspect everybody, at least in one of their courses, has to deal with supply and demand. I just don't see accountants thinking about supply and demand. And, and if they're going to have limited supply, mm -hmm. which it seems like we are, Every indicator is pointing towards supply being more limited. Mm -hmm. um, what do we, I mean, how do we think about this so, from a um, demand perspective? Yeah, I, I mean, I think a couple of things. So we know the profession is going to try to stimulate that idea of supply and in, in, uh, engaging with the people in high school, you know, getting the image up and working with universities. That's that's going to happen. So that will make a, a bit of a, de a dent. It won't be immediate. It will be over the next you know, year, probably. And and then there's the notion of really reexamining back to what we said earlier, Darren, which is this is your time to reimagine, and reinvent your business like everyone else is doing. So I think you want to start with I would go supply and demand. Yes, critical and business models. So have you started to think about, can I package my tax services as a subscription? I mean, I've seen creative things from firms where mm -hmm. they said, I'm going to make it audit proof. Think about what right now you're hearing a proposal to hire how many more IRS agents to go out and dig for money. That, what's that going to mean? You're going to get more notices, more audits. So if I'm a CPA firm doing tax, I would go, wow, what if I could give them an audit proof package? that says on a subscription, you're gonna pay this much and whatever you get notice wise, I'm gonna to respond to that for this fee. And you make that fee monthly, so it's spread out and the client doesn't feel yep. one big hit at end of year. And then, you know, you're gonna to have to balance that risk. If I do this with all my clients or, or even half of them, will they all get audited? Probably not. Now, maybe a little bit more will as they put in this, if they get through this new agent thing. But the point is, you could be offering that like peace of mind and getting paid a premium and being yeah. able to do that kind of work, right? That would be an example of, you know, change your business model slightly. Are your clients matched to what you really want to do and what you're good at providing? And so a lot of firms don't want to do the client culling thing, which is, do I get rid of my D clients to make room for A clients? That's another exercise you should be thinking. And, and if you do that, the key point here is you don't have to, the, everyone says, I don't want to fire a client. It's like, it's everything I had to do to get the business started. So don't fire them, price it. So you say, you know, listen, to serve you in the best way I can with what I know how to do, I need to charge you this amount of money. And and so far, we, you, you have been willing to pay that. So this is, I can do it if you're willing to pay this premium. So then you, you know, upgrade them into that notion. And suddenly a D client is now a B client, right? And then the you know then you start mapping those services, and then I, then I think you start to think about um, are there any other options that you can do to help you move your business to where you're absolutely great at, and clients love what you do there. And then you have to shed some of that clients that don't fit that model, right? That's tying it to your vision and purpose uh, of your organization. You know what I see with small firms, Tom, uh, is sort of this, um, uh, I, would, I would say just a lack of self-awareness at the value that they're creating for their customers. Um, because it comes a little bit more natural to them, they don't see how much value gets created for those that they're, they're serving, and therefore they, under, they undervalue that. Correct. Or they're afraid, they're afraid to, uh, to value it appropriately. And I, I think what we're saying right now is one of the things that it's it's sort of imminent is if we have a supply and demand issue that doesn't appear to be going away, significant energy needs to be put into thinking about how you price and package your solutions. Is that a fair way of looking at that? It's absolutely. Do you know any other business that's not doing that right now? 
er, er, everybody's doing it right now, but the profession <laughs> has a tendency to just sort of, you know, continue to provide more value and and not charge for it because of our insecurity. I, I don't think big firms necessarily fall into that category. So I, I would put them aside. I, I'm really speaking towards the, the small firm uh, at this point. I, I can tell you, Darren, I know some larger firms that are guilty of the same exact thing. So it isn't, it isn't limited mm-hmm. to the small practice. But, but the small practice, you're right, is, is acute because they probably have the deeper relationship one-on-one with their clients. And and that's what makes it harder. I'll give you an example I hear all the time. So a client calls you up and says, what kind of um, structure for my business should I take for, for tax purposes? C-Corp, S-Corp, partnership. And the, and the CPA will give that away, right? The, like, that should be something that you... So I'm now right. seeing some firms giving, putting models out that say, here's my, like, uh, you can contact me anytime. And here's my fee on a subscription basis, monthly billing, and that way you can have peace of mind that you're not going to worry about the meter running. You're just going to call me up and take, take, I'll take your call anytime. Um, we're also hearing where staff are getting texted or emailed or contacted by clients all times of day and night and the weekends. And so if that's true and you're not getting any premium for that, you're burning your staff out because they don't like it typically or they don't like it if it keeps going. And you're not getting the value for what you're doing. So just like everything else, you pay for access. And this would be, you know what, here's my program. We'll get back to you in 24 hours if you have questions. Um, that's our standard. But if you want to make sure we get to you in within a couple hours, that's a premium. And here's what that costs. That would be a way to deal with that. And then your people will feel like, okay, now I got it. And we can do a team on that client so we can hand it off, you know, when Darren's on on vacation, I've got the ball. And when I'm, I'm on vacation, Darren's got the ball, right? That kind of thing. I love it. Just this whole reimagining at the way we do this, this particular business, which kind of leads me into my, my next topic. This is something I've been on Tom. So I'll be interested to hear whether, or you, whether you agree with me or not is somewhere along the line, tax prep became the responsibility of every accounting, every small accounting firm and and to some degree larger accounting firms and specifically high volume tax prep. And I'm yet to find a firm, I'm yet to find a firm, Tom, that um, is not completely burnt out by tax season or overwhelmed by it, driving their staff away because tax season is so challenging. And, And what I'm not advocating right now is that firms do no tax. I mean, I don't think that's the answer. What I'm advocating is, is the right amount of tax and knowing what that number is. Does that make any sense at all? It makes total sense. And I, I, I you know, I have plenty of friends in this profession that are exactly what you're talking about, the, the burnout around tax. And, and by the way, the AICPA, we've been working on that for years, um, trying to like smooth that out. But you're not going to change those dates because there's cash flow tied to it. And, and to change the payment structure and the tax deadlines mm-hmm. is next to impossible. So, we're, I mean, we're not losing sight of it, but it isn't easy. Uh, so you're not going to get a, a regulatory solution easily. So what's that mean? You're going to have to figure out how can I do this? So to your point, uh, Darren, many of us took the idea of we're going to be a tax factory. We'll just take all the tax work we can get. We'll keep cranking right. it out to all hours of the day and night and uh, and make good money. And yeah, that's the point. But as taxes are changing, uh, that's not working. Not to say the other part is you're missing the whole big point of doing taxes, right? Is to be part of the business planning or part of the family planning. So what we're seeing now is really sharp firms, whether they're sole practitioner or they're all the way up in the you know top hundred, they're wrapping financial planning around tax. Because when you're doing the tax return, you pretty much have insight into all the things that that person's doing. And you can ask questions like, do you have enough insurance? You know, what's 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 going on with your children? How's this relate to your business? Are you going to try to hand it over? Or are you going to end up flipping it or selling it? Either way, if I'm part of that conversation as your CPA, I can help you think through that. So that's where I think there's just tons of opportunity. And so, again, we're all reluctant to, like, cut the volume back. But you could cut the volume back and actually make more money, especially when you 
focus on the big, the right clients that fit your sweet spot. And then you raise prices on the other ones. And if they leave, uh, for everyone that leaves, probably one or two stay and you end up with a net net. I mean, I've done this with firms and they ended up net better with a lot less work. And what would that mean to your staff yeah. right now and to your whole town? Yeah. As somebody, Tom, who did a thousand tax returns a year for many, many years, <laughs> you know, it's it's one of those things that sucks the life out of your firm. And it's it's super hard to give up. I, I really do understand that because when you're when you're getting four or five, six hundred dollars a clip at those and you know it doesn't take you that long to do them, um, it's 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 very addictive, if, yeah. if you will, to to keep doing that. Yeah. But the challenge is right now we it's it's workload compression it's staffing shortages it's it's not keeping up with technology it's not implementing automation so it's it's this thing that lasts six seven months and sometimes longer a year um and and it's keeping you it, it eventually potentially could kill could kill your firm uh in the long run by by not paying attention to this particular issue yeah and in this environment, Darren, it's fatal, right? Because <clears throat> your staff don't have to tolerate those long hours. They're looking at right. all kinds of flex work in, in environments. And and in the age of the great resignation, they're going to say, I I'm just going to get out of this. Yeah, I wouldn't do it. I, I wouldn't do yeah. it again. I wouldn't go back and do that again. Yeah. Because, you know, when you've lived through tax season after tax season, you know, you kind of give up your life for three or four months. And to your point in the beginning, you know, you can do a few things for a while. But once you do something for three or four months, it starts becoming a habit. And then it takes you a while to unwind that. So then then you're halfway to two thirds of the way through the year before you kind of get your your soul back, if you would. Well, and then you start over again in January. Yeah. Uh, it just it just doesn't make sense. So um well, I know we're we're starting to run a little bit long, Tom, but I, 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 I've got to ask you a question. So what do you think the next big thing is? Uh, and when do you think our listeners should care about this? What do you see that next big thing is that we're not we haven't talked about so far? So by by all the research that I've seen right now, I think I'm going to say there's actually three things. And I think it's going to matter now because we've already accelerated five years into the future, right? 2021 is the new, uh, is now like 2026. It's That's where yep. we are. So three things. I think this expansion of the role as a strategic business advisor, you and I spent a couple, you know, a lot about talking about that. This is your defining moment as a firm. And it's time to take that place and then deploy technology you know, the outs, whatever you have to do to rearrange, reimagine your practice so that you can be that strategic advisor and use the brain that the accounting profession has given you, right, from all that knowledge. Second is rapid adoption of tax and accounting technology. Technology is going to be a major influencer, even more so than it was pre-pandemic. So now is a time to invest and to think about and get it. And you've got people like Darren out here, right, all these groups that can help you understand and figure out what's there. Go to those conferences, listen to what people are saying, hear some you know shows about like what Rootworks is doing. Third is is you got to get to a flexible distributed work environment. Don't call it remote. Don't call it hybrid. Flexible distributed work environment. Young professionals have been asking about this for ten years, and now that they have it, they're not going to go back. So if you want to track mm -hmm. anyone into your firm. You've got to figure out this idea of flexible distributed work. I love that terminology, Tom, of flex, flexible distributed work environment, because that's exactly how I want to work today. I mean, right. the concept of going back with butts and seats is the way I've always sort of phrased it. And trying to measure based on, on butts and seats makes no sense anymore. And, and I think people are not going to do it. They, they're voting with their feet as we speak, right, Darren? So that's the way it you is. can start to flip it and begin back to attracting good talent and getting yourself moving again. Well, I think those are three um, awesome what's next, Tom. 
but I, I, I agree with you. I, I think the time is, I think the time is now it's imminent. We we've, we've hit an inflection point. We're beyond the inflection point and now it's happening. Those firms that are not paying attention to the things that seem to be clear, um, you know, it's, it's not going to be an immediate, it's not going to be an immediate death, but it's going to be, it's going to be a slow move over the next, you know, few years to, to irrelevance if, if you're not paying attention to these things. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Darren. And, and, you know, this is the stuff that you've been preaching for quite a while. So, um, but now it's time to listen. It, it is time to act. Tom, thanks so much for spending time with us today and uh, great job and congratulations on your role at the AICPA and, and um, keep doing great work. Awesome. You too, Darren. Thank you. Thank you.